Lee Isaac Chung is the writer and director behind Minati. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with the man himself. And I want to begin by just talking about the award success of this film. I mean, you've certainly gotten a taste of the whole award scene with some of your other films, but this is just on a whole other level with Critics Awards, Independent Spirit Awards, SAG Awards, Golden Globes. <laughs> I'm curious what yeah. all of this feels like, especially with the film being so, you know, personal to you and why you think it's resonated with so many people. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Um, it, it's been surreal, to be honest. It's pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty strange. I honestly, when we make this, when we made this film, we weren't talking about awards or thinking about awards. Um, but to have this happen and for people to be connecting with it, it's it's been unreal. Um, I. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to describe it because a lot of it's also happening on my laptop screen because um, <laughs> we're pretty much locked away here in our in our home. Um, so sometimes I wonder, is this really happening? Um, but it, but it's been great. I don't I don't know it, 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 in terms of why it's connecting. I I tried to make a personal film and I've just been honored and blessed that people relate to that 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 story of, of what I'm wrestling with that other people feel like they wrestle with the same sorts of things and that their families have gone through this through similar experiences um, to me that's been profoundly moving and maybe the most rewarding thing about this whole thing is, is just feeling like there's a community of us who um, really understand uh, or have shared experiences even when we don't look alike or come from the same places. Yeah, that's certainly how I felt, especially kind of with the grandmother uh, storyline yeah, as well. Yeah. But uh, just going back to the beginning, um, the initial stages of you writing the script, was there like a memory or a, like a motivating factor in you wanting to tell this story that shared, from what I understand, some similarities with your own up upbringing? Yeah, uh, for, for me, honestly, it all started when I was researching this writer named Willa Cather. And I was thinking about maybe trying to adapt something that she had written. Uh, but um, what I came across with her was a quote in which she said she, her, her work took off once she stopped admiring, uh, admiring other writers and she just started to remember. And I thought, well, that's kind of what I'm doing here even. I'm trying to admire her and I'm not actually spending the time to remember back to what it was like to be a kid. And she wrote about being a kid on a farm in Nebraska, and, and that served um, the making, uh, she wrote so many incredible books that way. Um, so I thought, I have my own story. I, I want to start remembering back to what it was like to be a, a boy on a farm. Um, and I remembered back to the, the age of around five to eight. That's when we first moved to the farm. And coincidentally, that was the age that my daughter was at the time. And it was also the age that I was the age that my father was when he moved us to that farm. So it just felt like that's the time I need to focus on. And I just started to remember all these different things and then uh, on paper. And I started to see the semblance of a story taking shape. And that's how Minati really began. Hmm. Well, can you talk about uh, using the Minati plant as a symbol, just where the idea came from and why it ultimately felt right to make that the uh, title of the film? Yeah, I, I always like um, songs that have something in it that's quite mundane, but that uh, it, it in and of itself, it doesn't mean anything, but it, somehow it contains a, a deep, very deep emotion. Mm -hmm. And to me that, uh, that felt like what Minari could be in this film. Uh, one of the memories that I had when I was doing my exercise was uh, that my grandmother used to take me down to this plot of land uh, by a creek and she would plant this seed called Minari. And it was from Korea. Um, it, it was something that would only grow in these places where nothing else would grow. You kind of grow it in places where uh, it's very muddy and dirty. And the plant ends up cleaning that area up. Um, to me, I, that experience and that plant symbolizes a lot of the way I feel about my grandma and about her values and um, the love that she has has for me or had for me. And um, that's what it meant to me. And I thought, as soon as I remember that, I thought this film is gonna be called Minari and it has to end at this Minari patch. Um, and, and ultimately that, that was the plant that was the, 
the only plant that grew well on our farm. So I always felt like that meant something. Hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and I also want to just dig into some of these characters here because they're very fascinating with uh, Monica and Jacob, especially the mother and father of this family. We do see them arguing quite a bit throughout the film because they really kind of have opposing views on a number of things. Um, yeah. So when you were thinking about their their backstory, what was it that you think kind of initially brought them together? Um. I, I've always felt like their backstory is one of very deep romance and um, that in Korea, they had a very romantic idealized idea of uh, what their lives were gonna entail. They're, they were about to embark on a wild adventure together. Um, and I, And now they're on the other side of that where they're on the adventure, but it's not a good adventure at mm -hmm. all. If anything, their lives are kind of falling apart. So th they're having a lot of conflicts. And um, that, that, it, that spoke a lot to what I saw growing up, um, not just in my own home, but many homes of Korean immigrants. Um, you you kind of see couples that are being tested in incredible ways. And you realize that their romance really was something of beauty in, in the home country. But here um, it's been tested and now it's really turned to something that's um, always in conflict. Uh, or always in crisis. So um, yeah, that, that was my, I, my sense of the backstory and why I wanted to include that song that they remember back to, and then let that song echo out into the, the night of Arkansas of, of this town that's completely foreign from where they first heard it. Yeah, that's fascinating. And uh, I spoke with Yeti Han a few weeks ago, and she mentioned that she thought that her and Jacob kind of, it was like a first love, last love situation for Monica. So I don't know. I, th I thought that was interesting. Just, I want to, I want to know more about their story. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've been thinking about this as I've been talking to some of the cast and even the crew too, over the past few weeks, just you as a director, we're working with so many different actors with different backgrounds, you know, where Alan Kim, this is his debut performance from what I understand. Yeah. And Yoo Jung Yun is this legend in South Korea with decades of experience. Steven Yun yeah. is an American actor. Yeti Han is a Korean actress, but she doesn't really have like the wealth of experience that Yoo Jung Yun has. But was it kind of challenging to wrangle all that together and just also focus individually on, you know, attending to their needs as actors? Um, to me, that's the fun of it. That's mm. so much the fun of directing. And, and I almost feel like I'm in this job for that. Like I, I, I love the person to person basis of this work. And, um, you know, Will Patton, for instance, his style and his approach is so different and so unique. And it, it draws out, brings out such a great performance and also draws out interesting things out of other actors. Um, Steven's the same. Everybody's the same. Like, everyone has a different approach and different need. And I love kind of being someone who can witness it and also try to fine tune everyone to each other and, and really meet them where they are. Um, I, it's, it's the opposite of what I think a lot of people feel directing is about, which is hammering people together and getting them to execute your will. Um, to me, it's more about um, enabling people to, to be artists and to um, simply balance each other to the greater vision of the picture. And um, yeah, in that way, it, it was fun. It, it's always challenging, but it's, it's a good challenge, I'd say. Mm. Well, it's also a film that does feel pretty universal, but there is that level of specificity to it in just the details. Was there one of those details or like a background element or like an object, maybe something that was important to you to include in order to really uh, reflect that experience of growing up as a Korean American family in specifically the 1980s. Um, there, there was a lot uh, and mm -hmm. Yong Ok Lee, the production designer and I, we worked a lot on these little details and uh, you know, she was bringing things over from Korea and also uh, scouring different flea markets and stuff in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City and Tulsa and pulling together all kinds of things. But I think the key thing for, for me and for her was this trailer home because it, it, it had to really fit that era. And then it also had to have life of its own in which um, as the family is slowly 
growing into a family and living in that space, the, the trailer home has to change as well. Like the way that it's furnished, the way that things are being added onto it, it starts off as a box on wheels with no stairs. And then ultimately you see more and more things added onto it. Um, so we, we paid so much attention to the character of that trailer home. And um, there was one day on set that I walked onto the set and I opened the back door and I was just, I expected to see the farm. I expected to see my childhood farm oh. just because um, what Yongwook had done just was so true to life. Um, and I'll never forget that, that feeling of, of being spiritually transformed to that little kid uh, because of what Yongwook had done. Wow. Um, I'm also just curious about, you know, there's so many beautiful details here, but I'm also curious about what's not here. Um, was there anything that you were thinking about including in the film, whether it was even at the script level or in post-production that didn't make it in because it didn't feel right for the story you wanted to tell or cut for time or anything like that? Oh yeah, we, we had a lot of things that we ended up cutting out, um, hmm. scenes that we loved. Um, a lot of things that go into backstory for all the characters, uh, including like Will Patton's. Um, we, we just found that we needed to pare it down to the essential story. Um, and in the writing phase that was happening a lot too. Like I, I just felt like I would go down these threads because it's such a personal story that I would want to incorporate something um, some little detail that I just wanted to preserve from my life, but I, I'd have to, I'd have to do some do uh, some injustice to myself and cut it out if that makes sense, like mm -hmm. uh, to to not be overly sympathetic or to myself, um, because at the end of the day, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. kill your darlings because at the end of the day, I felt like I want to set a table for people that this this be a a, a table that's open and, open and welcoming to people. And I didn't want to fill it up with things that are just for me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that that balance was really tough to figure out. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I still wrestle with it. Well, I think another thing that people are responding to with this film is just the atmosphere. Um, there's a real kind of warmth to the film, I think. Some of that just from the the weather itself in, in Tulsa, but <laughs> yeah, there's some right. something about almost nostalgic there about it. And the music is so, you know, melodic and soothing. Uh, what was the atmosphere you were hoping to create through all of those different craft elements? Mm, yeah, I, I guess I did want it to feel like, um, uh, I, I did want it to feel like an embrace of some sorts. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love Charlie Chaplin. Like I, I, I know that guy, uh, that guy, that incredible filmmaker. Um, right. He, he, uh, he went through a lot in his life as a kid and um, as someone growing up in London and he was able to turn everything he went through into something of very deep beauty and enjoyment and joy for other people. Um, and that's something that's always resonated with me. I don't like projects or I, I'm not attracted to, to projects that are going to dwell in pain somehow um, because I, I feel like we have a lot of that in the world. Um, so I, I, with this one, I wanted it to feel like it, it treats those things um, in a mature way, but it doesn't dwell on them and it doesn't elevate those things uh, above the, the actual humanity of who we are, the joy that we have in life and, and that we should have in life. Um, I, I wanted the audience to have something of joy, basically. Yeah, I, we certainly feel that. Um, and so it. you make the film, it's, it's at Sundance, it wins a few awards there, and it has a huge positive response from the audience. What was that whole atmosphere like uh, experiencing that um it was it was unreal um i every screening we had felt very magical and we had like our family members were there steven's parents my parents christina O, oh, her uh, our producer her parents came um so it felt uh, like a family affair and all the cast and crew we really bonded in the production of this so we were all getting to hang out together we were eating uh 
cup noodles and stuff every uh, at night in our condos <laughs> together. Um, so it, it was just so fun. And we were hearing echoes of a virus that's coming um, and had, had no idea what was in store for us, but we really had a, a very special time together. And my sister came at the end. She came because she, she saw that I was gonna go home. And she said, no, I think you're gonna win something. And I, I told her she's crazy. And she, she came and said, you're gonna have to stay for every screening because I'm here now. You can leave me if you want, but I'm gonna be here. And uh, I stayed with her and she came with me to the awards and, and winning the prizes with her there. I mean, that was really special too. Um, well, I wanted to just touch on this briefly, but speaking of awards, there has been this big discussion online about Minati uh, being slotted into some best foreign film categories, most notably at the Golden Globes, of course, where it wasn't even eligible for best picture because of their rules. Um, you know, many people have pointed out that this isn't a foreign film. This is an American film that just happens to not have characters that are speaking English for most of it. Do you have a perspective now on um, on those discussions? Um, yeah, I, I, I have so many opinions about it, or not opinions, but just so many thoughts and feelings yeah. about it. Um, I, I, I have a lot of friends who were definitely texting me around that time, Asian American friends, um, and they kind of feel the anger and, and uh, we, we've all been through different types of experiences in our lives where we're made to feel like we're foreigners to this place. So, um, you know, m my heart was kind of breaking about that. Um, and at the same time, like, um, I don't know, like I, I, I just felt like when I was making this film, I wasn't thinking about awards. I wasn't thinking about Golden Globes so it's it's not as though at this point in my life that I, I I was thinking like we deserve to be nominated for this or that prize like I, my, I don't let my mind go there um so I, I'm torn about even making any claim like that all I can say is um in general on a very philosophical level um there are all kinds of categories that we have over people and we try to define people try to define uh, their place in a country um, and I think it's good when we're we're being challenged in our categories that we set up um, especially when people feel that those categories don't apply so I, I felt as though this has raised some dialogue and I'm hoping that dialogue continues and um, I don't know. Uh, that grandmother in the film, she doesn't care. Uh, you know, she she doesn't care if if we're being called foreign or we're being called American or whatever. You know, uh, the the spirit of Minari is is of people who are not being defined outwardly. They're really more concerned with their family, with with loving each other, and and that's kind of the place that I want to be uh, myself. Yeah, um, uh, very well said. And just in the last minute or two here, as we wrap up, you know, Steven Yun and Ye Jung Yoon have received so many nominations and awards for their performances, which is very deserved. But, you know, Yeti Han and Alan Kim are also both fantastic, but they haven't really had the same level of uh, recognition. So as a director, I'm, I'm wondering if you could even just speak to the quality of their performances from your perspective just you know from what you've observed on set kind of advocate yeah. for them if you will <laughs> oh I, I all i can say with uh yeti han uh first i'll start with yeti um every time that harry yoon and i the editor we felt like we were in a tough spot with the film we just kept pointing to a sign and it says when in doubt go to yeti go to yeti han <laughs> So we would cut to a close-up of her um, because every moment of this film, when she was on set and working, she's doing something and she's feeling something. And we, we know how to feel in the film because we see her face. And uh, there are many times in the film, if you just watch and decide to focus only on her face, uh, you'll see that Harry and I, we decided to let her expression be the anchor, the emotional anchor of this film. So, um, it's, it's a tribute to her. She's, she embodied that role and she puts so much depth into that character. Um, and I, I do wish more people would notice and I'm so glad you're asking me about that. 
And, and Alan is such a special actor. Um, I, I heard horror stories about working with kids and that all went out the window when I started working with him. He was a miracle. He, he memorized all his lines. He'd show up every day and he brought out the best in every actor because he just doesn't lie. There's no, nothing false in what he does. So um, all the actors at one point would come up to me and say, uh, when I'm in a scene with him, I can't lie because he's so real and he's so honest. Um, so I think he elevated people. And um, I, I love what he did. I loved working with him. And uh, what I also love is that he's just a kid and, um, and he's taking all this in stride, what's happening right now. Yeah. And I, I do at the same time, hope people will notice him and give him recognition. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that the cast got the, the ensemble nomination at SAG. That's incredibly yeah, I was deserved. So excited. Thank you so um, much. I was so excited about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Isaac, for your time. It's a remarkable film. And I, I wish you all the best with, uh, you know, whatever awards may come in the future. But either way, Thank you've you made so a much, very Kevin. special film. Um, I, I appreciate that so much. Thank you for yeah. this. And uh, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews and head to goldderby.com to make your awards show predictions. Thank you.